This is Jim Horman with Horman Soil Health Services. Today we're going to talk a little bit about soil compaction and when we start with soil compaction we need to know what is an ideal soil. And soil is made up roughly of about 45 percent inorganic minerals. That's just ground up rock which is uh, sand, silt, and clay. Your sand's going to break down into your silt and silt breaks down into clay. Uh, the other solid portion is your organic matter. That's about 5% in a really good soil. About 50% of a soil is actually just pore space, and that's made up of about 25% water and 25% air. Now, obviously, when it rains, uh, that can be fully saturated, or if you've got a really dry summer, you may have less air in your soil. When we look at some common bulk densities, uh, bulk density is just the weight in grams of your soil divided uh, by the volume, which is measured in centimeters uh, cubed. So it's mass or weight divided by uh, volume. And uh, when we look at an uncultivated, undisturbed woodlot, we'll see that the bulk density is somewhere maybe around 1 to about 1.2. If we look at the other end, something like concrete, it's somewhere around 2.4. So obviously, as we get more compacted or we have uh, more dense materials, uh, the number goes up. The highest bulk density is about 2.65, and we can use that number to figure out how much pore space we have and how much solid material. So what we're measuring here is a solid material. So if you take an uncultivated woodlot, let's say it's uh, like about a 1.2 to 1.3. If you divide 1.3 into 2.65, that means that's roughly about 50% solid material, and that means then that the other half of that is going to be about pore space. If you look at something like this compacted glacial till at 2.2, it's about 85% solid material. It's only 15% uh, pore space. So once we get uh, above about 1.6 grams per centimeter cubed, it becomes root limiting. And above 1.8, definitely the roots are restricted. But this does vary from the type of soil texture that you have. So that applies to a sand. Uh, sand becomes anytime it's less than 1.6, you, you'll have good root growth. But once it gets above 1.6, becomes limiting and greater than 1.8, what happens is we get J roots, and that means that the roots will go down to that layer and they'll go off at a right hand angle. For clay, you can see that uh, the number is quite a bit lower. The ideal is somewhere less than 1.1 grams per centimeter cubed, and uh, once we get above 1.47, then uh, the roots are severely limited and they're not going to be able to penetrate that soil. This comes from the NRCS Soil Quality Handbook, this slide. We're looking at bulk density and compaction. You can see here that we can still see the plow pan from about 50, 60 years ago. We used to uh, plow the soil anywhere from 6 to 8 inches deep. And right around seven inches in this particular graph, we'll see that the bulk density goes from 1.43 in the top six inches down to about uh, all of a sudden now it's 1.9. And the reason for that is that when we plow, what we're doing is we're smearing that plow pan. We're actually taking the wet soil and it's becoming very compacted. And then the roots will have a very difficult time getting through that compacted layer. Anytime in a clay soil, you're above 1.4 to 1.47, roots won't be able to get into that compacted layer or through that compacted layer. You can see in this graph, though, that actually once we get through that compacted layer, that the bulk density starts to uh, decrease and then it, then it eventually increases. In an undisturbed soil, the bulk density should gradually increase as you go deeper in the soil. Soil organic matter characteristics, uh, if you look at it, our soil is, the soil organic matter is very light. It's kind of like a sponge. 1% soil organic matter by weight is going to take up a lot of surface area. So that's 5% of your soil volume. Uh, soil organic has less density than the uh, soil. So there's a lot more space for air and water storage. Every pound of soil organic matter can hold anywhere from about 18 to 20 pounds of water. And so soil organic matter does act like a sponge. 
We compare that to some of these electronic photographs of soil organic matter and uh, clay particles. You'll notice that the soil organic matter has a lot of pore space. You can see that uh, by that black area. Compare that to uh, these clay particles. They look like little plates uh, stuck together. And that's the silicon and the aluminum in, in our soil forming these plates, and it's very, very dense. And around these uh, clay particles, we're going to have soil organic matter, and that's going to improve our cation exchange capacity. So cations are positive ions and anions are negative. When we put that organic matter around these clay, clay has a negative charge. It will hold the cations, but soil organic matter can hold both cations and uh, anions, and it has 10 times the cation exchange capacity that clay does by itself. So this just shows uh, what the soil kind of does when it becomes compacted. We've got here, it looks like a flood uh, on this pavement. Uh, dense soils act like road pavement. Uh, they do result in flash floods. Compacted soils have higher density than regular soil, so it has less space for air and water storage. Typically, when that bulk density gets above uh, about 1.8 to 1, 1.6 to 1.8 grams per centimeter cubed, that's when we're going to start to have some issues with flooding and uh, ponding water. Also, dense soils have a lot less uh, microbial activity and biological life just because they have less pore space. There are three soil compaction uh, factors. Uh, heavy equipment uh, is the one that we think about the most often, but heavy equipment isn't really uh, the, maybe the biggest reason or the only reason for compaction in the soil. Rain, uh, when we get a very heavy rain and hard rain, uh, that rain can come down at 30 to 35 mile per hour, and that can compact your soil and gravity. So we have three things that can help to uh, for soil to become more dense. But when we notice, if you go out into a field and you start probing around, you're going to find that it seems fairly uniform. So it's not just the wheel traffic, it's actually the tillage and those tillage tools that are smearing your soil. So we now have compacted layers in our soil that are not only six to eight inches deep, but when we're doing this vertical tillage at two to four inches, we have compacted layers that are, are much less shallow. And is there a visual way to measure some of this soil compaction? So as you look at um, uh, the soil, and if you're going down the road, you might notice uh, every once in a while, you'll see a fence row. And you'll notice it looks like there's an elevation difference. So I've gone out and I've measured some of this. I've even measured it on the lee side of a woods because one of the professors I talked to thought that, uh, hey, that could just be soil erosion. But when you measure it on the lee side of a woods, you'll find that, hey, that uh, uh, fence row is about six to nine inches higher than the rest of the field. So what's causing that? Well, as we till the soil, we're getting rid of a lot of the void space, 50% of the void space, but we're also burning up the carbon. We're burning up the organic matter. And when we're doing that, our soils become more dense. If 50% of that void space in that six to nine inches could hold water, that would be equal to three to four and a half inches of additional water storage capacity that we're losing on average. This becomes really important, not only in the middle of a drought, but when we have rains, having less storage capacity means we're more susceptible to flooding. So having that extra uh, storage capacity in these virgin soils equals less flooding. We can also take a look in Northwest Ohio. This picture was taken several years ago on a Hoytville clay soil. Uh, we had long-term no-till uh, soils compared to uh, rotational tillage. You can see there, so you can see there uh, where we looked at, um, uh, I'm going to start this slide over because I didn't see it on my phone. Apparently, it's still recording. So this is long-term no-till versus uh, rotational tillage. And uh, this is in a Hoytville soil in northwest Ohio. And at this particular site a couple years ago, we got three quarters of an inch of rain, and these two fields were less than one-eighth mile apart. Now, notice on the right-hand side, 
where we had uh, no-till soybeans, and then this year we had uh, uh, tilled corn. Notice that when we got that rain, we have standing water ponding on the soil. Right next to it, just a quarter mile, eighth of a mile down the road, we had a long-term no-till system, a long-term no-till soybeans, and strip-till corn, and there's no standing water. Again, this just shows the impact of, of tillage and compaction on water storage in these soils. You can also see that this happens all over the United States. These four pictures were taken at an intersection of a Kansas road. In the upper left-hand corner, we have a no-till field, and the uh, four fields around it, you can see that we have standing water uh, in all three of these fields uh, from the same rainfall event that occurred uh, at this time. So you can see that this, this happens all over the United States. Here's a picture in Brookings County, South Dakota. On the left-hand side, we have a long-term no-till field and we have no ponded water. And on the right-hand side, we have pond and water that occurred in a conventional tilled field. You can also see almost, it looks like an elevation difference there uh, because right in between these two fields is a little bit of a fence row. And, and you can see that it looks like that soil on the right-hand side that was tilled looks like it has a lower elevation. And that just comes from tilling the soil. We're losing the organic matter out of our soil. We've lost anywhere from 50 to 80% of our soil organic matter uh, the original soil organic matter from our soils, and that's causing a problem with some of this compaction. Here we have another picture that shows where we have no cover on the left-hand side that, that's been tilled. We're having gully erosion. On the right-hand side where we have long-term no-till with a cover crop, you can see that we had a pretty good rainfall event there, but that water is uh, crystal clear. It's not as muddy and uh, that water will infiltrate into that soil and it's not gonna cause as much soil erosion. The key isn't how much rain falls, but what happens after it falls. Uh, it's how much the water can infiltrate into your soils and how much of it can be stored there via the uh, organic matter. So on the left-hand side, uh, we see that we have the soil pores are very disconnected. What happens when it rains? Uh, the mud uh, starts to coagulate, and uh, what happens is it'll seal off that soil so that the water cannot uh, infiltrate. On the left-hand side, the no-till, the residue left on the surface, uh, the water can infiltrate. It keeps those pores open so that we get better uh, water infiltration. We also see how much water can be stored in our soil. So this was some research done by Berman Hudson in 1994. He looked at sand, silt loams, and silty clay loam soils, and he looked at the percent organic matter. So every 1% organic matter in a sandy soil can hold one acre inch of water, in a silt loam soil can hold 1.9 inches of water. And this is per foot of soil. And then if you compare that to a silty clay loam, it's about 1.4. Now, the relationship does go down as you increase the organic matter. So look at a sandy soil. Now, it's pretty hard to get a 5% organic matter. But in this uh, particular study, where they had 5% organic matter, it held 2.5 inches of water per foot of soil. So if you take 2.5 divided by 5, it's somewhere between 0.5, and then you see where it's at 1. It's between 0.5 and 1 acre inches of water per foot of soil. On the silty loam, we had 4 acre inches of water there at 5% organic matter. So 4.0 divided by 5 is about 0.8. So on a silty clay loam, it, it's going to vary between 0.8 all the way up to uh, 1.9 acre inches of water. And on the silty clay loam, uh, it's 3 acres inches of water at 5% organic matter. That's about 0.6 uh, acre inches per per uh, one percent organic matter so it's going to vary from 0.6 all the way up to about 1.4 just to give you an idea how much water we can store in in the soil and again this is per one foot of soil dynamic properties of infiltration it is highly related to how much residue we have uh, on that soil surface when we plow it a soil, this is research that was done at Ohio State University. We can see that we get about a quarter inch of uh, water infiltration per hour, 0.26. Uh, if we have no-till and, and we keep that bare, what happens is when it rains, the soil starts to uh, seal over and it'll clog those pores. So it goes down to 0.11 inch per hour. Uh, if we put 40% residue cover on that no-till, it's going to increase to 0.46. 
And if we add 80% cover, it'll go up to 1.04 inches of water per hour. So uh, it is really important that we have not only the uh, residue on the surface, but also those roots to create the pores in the first place. So the more residue you have, the more you're going to protect that soil and keep those pores open. Water uptake occurs by a plant. Most of it occurs within the top foot. Over 70% of the water that a plant will uptake uh, comes because that's where most of the organic matter and that's where most of the roots and also where most of the nutrients are. So you can see by this diagram about 40% of the water taken up by this plant is going to occur in that top six inches. If you add another six inches, you're going to gain about 30%. Every six inches, it starts to go down a little. So it goes from 40 in the top six to 30 in the next six inches to 20% of the water uptake in that uh, down there around 18 inches and then only about 10% when we get down two feet in the soil. Water uptake is also related to nutrient extraction. So when you look wherever there's the water, that's also where the nutrients are and that's how the roots are going to transport those nutrients is, is with that water. So most of the nutrients are, are taken into the roots through moist water. So in that top six inches, 40% of your nutrients are extracted. When you go down another six inches, you can gain another 30%. And if you go down uh, 12, between 12 and 18 inches, you'll get 20%. And roughly between uh, 18 and 24 inches, another 10%. You can see that if, if you have a really dry year uh, and our soils are compacted, uh, you're not going to be able to get maybe only half of the nutrients at best. But if you have a soil that is not compacted, you not only can get water, but you can get more nutrients deeper in the soil. So it is important that we have a, a good soil structure and uh, not have compaction in our soils. Also, uh, compaction and tillage has an impact on soil temperature. Where we have bare soils, they tend to be hotter and uh, we have less biological life. So this was a picture taken a couple of years ago on a conventional tilled soil. You can see the uh, temperature there in Fahrenheit was over 107 degrees. And uh, right next to it, where we had no till on a cover crop, the soil temperature was around 87 degrees. So you're going to have a lot more biological life and also be able to conserve more moisture where you have lower temperatures, uh, especially in the middle of the summer. Water usage in a hot, dry summer. This is some information that came from uh, Elwin Taylor. He shows that for corn production, we need about uh, one acre inch of water every week when the soil temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. When we increase that soil temperature by 10 degrees to 85 degrees, now we double our water requirement. So now it goes up to two acre inches of water per week. And if we add another 10 degrees Fahrenheit and increase that soil temperature to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to double our water needs for that corn to produce 200 bushel corn to four acre inches of water per week. So two times the water requirement occurs for every 10 degree increase in soil temperature. You might ask, what is a one acre inch of water worth to you? According to Eldwin, it's worth about eight bushels of corn, six bushels of wheat, and about three and a half bushels of soybeans. For a 200 bushel corn crop, we need about 22 acre uh, inches of water a year. On average, we get somewhere around 19 to 23 inches, but the problem is a lot of times it comes in two, three, even four inch increments, and so not all of that water is fully used. So one acre inch of water fully used is worth about eight bushels of corn, and at $4, that's worth $32 an acre more in income to the farmer. So heat and drought do very quickly increase our yield losses. It's very important that we have good soil and high organic matter soil in order to uh, keep the water storage in our soils. This is just a picture of some soil compaction and some ruts. And you'll notice here there's a very typical picture of what happens when we rut up the soil. You'll see that we get this depression in the soil, but right next to it, it looks like there's a little hump. 
and uh, we'll show you what's going on here in, in another slide or two. But when we're looking at soil and we're looking at uh, the ruts, soil structure is related to uh, the arrangements of the soil particles. So it's all about root development and how water infiltrates. infiltrates. And this is a very dynamic property. When we're looking at soil compaction, we're really looking at the absence of these soil aggregates, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more, and also the, the absence of pore space. One of the things that we've discovered, this is some research that was done out of Nebraska, is that compaction can reduce your yields up to 60%, and compaction can last or persist for almost nine years. So once you compact the soil, it can stay around for a very long period of time. Also, uh, as we increase aggregation and aggregate stability, what we're really seeing is that's a result of uh, biological activity, okay? This is a result of the bacteria and the fungus in the soils forming these aggregates. And you'll see that where you have really good aggregation, you'll have increased organic matter. And generally, uh, this occurs much faster under no-till conditions, okay? Tillage is going to break up these aggregates and, and form very small micro-aggregates that are going to seal off and come back. One of the ways you can prevent soil compaction is just to stay off your wet soils. You don't want to be smearing them. Also, controlled or managed traffic will help. Once you do till the soil, we find that 80% of your soil compaction occurs from the wheel traffic from the very first pass of that tire over uh, freshly tilled soil. So most of that soil compaction happens almost immediately the first time you run across it. Uh, and and uh, if you're going to till it, you can also be smearing uh, that soil. This is that rut that we saw before, and you see this wheel track. And this is why we get uh, this form of this rut. Because what happens is the soil has a uh, pore space, and as you compact that soil, you're pushing down, then you're pushing out, and because there's already soil there, you're pushing up. And so typically, right next to the rut, we'll have this little bit of a hill, and that's coming from what we see anytime we see that the soil is being compacted. And when we go to fill this rut in, if we take a disc, well, notice it seems like uh, there's a loss of soil because we just don't seem to have enough to fill up the hole. Really what you're seeing is that the soil is compacted. It's not a loss of soil. We might have lost some organic matter, but really what, what we're seeing is that the pore space now has been compacted, and that's why you're seeing all that pore space at the top. You don't, we don't have a level field anymore because we've compacted that soil. This shows uh, what roots do, and roots believe it or not, actually compact the soil. So here we have this big radish root. It has a, a large mass, a large size, okay? It, it weighs quite a bit. It also has a fairly good uh, volume. And as that root goes into the soil, what happens is it's pushing down, it's pushing the soil out, and it's physically lifting and uncompacting that soil in some ways. It's adding pore space to the soil. So that's what roots do is they, they penetrate the soil and they actually lift it up and allow more pore space to occur uh, in, in the soils. Also, what you'll see, uh, this is an example here uh, where the radish impact on the bulk density. And this was taken at Dave Brandt's farm. And we can see here where we had a, a field on the right-hand side that was uh, a conventional field. And then Dave had put these radishes in a long-term no-till field. And you can see that there was a 40% reduction in soil compaction where we have the radish because the radishes are very good at loosening and uh, adding pore space uh, to our soils. When soils... Uh, are formed. They're formed out of microaggregates, and this just is a, a picture. It shows how microaggregates are formed. Microaggregates are the very smallest particles of uh, of soil, and they're formed from the uh, bacteria. Uh, the bacteria give off uh, different exudates, and uh, 40 to 60 percent of your soil microbial biomass is associated with these these microaggregates. So they're kind of just little pieces of soil that are clumped together. 90% of the bacteria are linked to these clay particles, 
And uh, these are going to form very, very tiny microaggregates. Microaggregates by themselves tend to seal off, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take these microaggregates, and with this next slide, we're going to show how the roots kind of reorient and compact these microaggregates to form macroaggregates. So what's happening is as these roots grow, they give off root exudates, and then the uh, mycorrhizae fungi give off and add glomulin and uh, different uh, root exudates and microbial poop, and all these things are all added together to form glues in the soil that so that when you start to dig in a really healthy soil, what you're going to find is you're going to find macro aggregates. The macro aggregates are kind of a uh, crumble. All right. And they allow air and water to get into our soil. And so this shows micro aggregates versus the macro aggregates. Macro aggregates are just made up of micro aggregates. You add in a few roots, you add in some microbial uh, debris. Uh, byproducts, uh, some of the glomulin, and that's going to give us soil that crumbles. Now, these macroaggregates are very uh, easy to uh, uh, break up, and so anytime we do tillage, they're going to fall apart. But what's also interesting is 80% of your carbon is stored in these macroaggregates. They also store a lot of water and also a lot of nutrients. So these macroaggregates are breaking down and reforming and then breaking down and reforming all the time and that's good for the soil but uh, the macro aggregates is also a big food source so the bacteria will eat the glues in there and if when you once you do a bunch of tillage what happens is we eat up a lot of these glues and then we don't have the glues left in the soil and then we have just micro aggregates when you get micro aggregates you're just going to get a soil that's going to be compacted so you can imagine, you've probably seen a farmer do this. You'll see farmers that'll just till their soils and get it just as fine as dust. Those are the microaggregates forming. What happens when it rains? As soon as it rains, it turns into concrete and it seals off and you can't get the water down. If you want to have good water infiltration, you got to have the macroaggregates. They're bigger soil particles that allows air and water to get into the soil. And not only with the macroaggregates, but also with more pores farming, forming from this roots, that allows our water to get into our soil so that it doesn't pond on the soil surface. So this is a diagram that shows that. These mycorrhizal fungi are very important. They supply a lot of the glomalin or glomulin, as some people will call it. The, they infect a lot of our plants. 80% of our plants are infected by these fungi. They're very efficient in bringing back water and nutrients to the plant. But they're also a source of that glomalin. And this is glomalin or glomulin. It's a sticky substance that surrounds the soil aggregates. And it's actually water insoluble. So actually these macro aggregates will shed water, but they'll also store water inside these macro aggregates. And that allows the water to flow through the soil by, uh, by having these macro aggregates. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, these are just really, uh, gl glomalin comes from um, the mycorrhizae of fungi when they break apart. It's really just kind of the guts of, of your mycorrhizae, some of the cellular tissue, uh, uh, components inside your mycorrhizae fungi. Building soil structures, a, a little bit like building a house. Um, the architect is uh, Mother Nature. Uh, the carpenter uh, are the uh, plants. And then our foundation is going to be made up of this sand, silt, and clay, okay? And a, a lot of times we have uh, the potassium and the calcium uh, ions in there, cations in there, that are going to help to kind of cement this sand, silt, and clay together. Clay particles have a negative charge, and we put a positive charge in between there. It helps to cement them together. And so the frame for the house is the roots. And uh, the nails are kind of like your humus, and the lag screws are kind of like phosphorus. A lot of times we'll have braces uh, in a house, and that's really coming from uh, the nitrogen and the sulfur. If you look at carbon, it's very flexible. It's almost like spaghetti. But when you add a triple bond like you know, that comes from nitrogen and sulfur, it makes that carbon a lot stronger. 
and we, we see this when we add sulfur to any kind of iron product, it's going to strengthen the iron. It makes it a lot stronger. The polysaccharides kind of like, act like insulation and glue uh, in our house. Uh, and then the house wrap is kind of the glomulin. And then our roof is, is that surface residue. So in this next picture where we're looking at this house, imagine we build this house and we start off with the foundation, and then we put in uh, the roots. Uh, so that's the wood in a house, and that gives us pore space. So rooms in a house, the reason we have rooms is because we've got the wood. Now, in order for that uh, wood to have some strength, we got to have the braces. That's your, your nitrogen and your sulfur. And then that phosphorus is going kind of like a lag screw. It's going to attach the foundation, the bricks, uh, to the wood in the house. And, and your nails, that's just tough. The human the long-term humus that's been around for 10,000, maybe even 100,000 years. And so that's very, very strong and uh, gives us strength to tie everything together. We're going to wrap our house in uh, insulation or glue. That comes from kind of this glomulin. So what we're really talking about, the foundation for our house is really just a macro aggregate. And then when we look at soil, um, the, the roof is really that surface residue. Now, you can imagine that what would happen if we had a tornado and a tornado came through and took off the residue, that would be your tillage, and just destroyed the residue on the soil surface. Well, if we did that on a house, it wouldn't take too long and our house would collapse because it would rot out, okay? The water would rot it out. Now, it's not water in the soil that rots out these macroaggregates. It's a combination of the tillage, the tornado, but also too much oxygen is going to oxidize a lot of these elements and they're going to fall apart and then the whole house starts to cave in. So uh, building soil aggregates is, is very similar to building a house, okay? Also, when we look at in the soil, there's a relationship between oxygen and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is heavier than the, than the oxygen, so they're kind of inversely related. If one increases, the other decreases. So when we open a soil up and we put in all the oxygen uh, by, by till, what happens is all the carbon dioxide basically escapes and goes up into the atmosphere, okay? So if we get too much oxygen in the soil, it causes carbon dioxide to be lost from the soil and it gets up into the atmosphere. So roots kind of act like a biological valve to control how much oxygen uh, gets in and how much carbon uh, is in the soil. Matter of fact, your roots are very good. Majority of the carbon dioxide is coming from the roots. The roots are taking in oxygen and they're giving off uh, carbon dioxide. OK, so that's how we get that carbon dioxide in the soil to begin with. Oxidation and the release of carbon dioxide. Uh, what happens is a lot of the oxygen uh, uh, and the carbon dioxide that's in this macro aggregate, once you start putting oxygen into the soil, the microbes start to eat the glues that are surrounding this macro aggregate. And with the disruption of the tillage, it's going to break it down into micro aggregates. These micro aggregates uh, don't have as much carbon in it, don't have as much glue. And uh, when it rains, they're going to set up like cement and they're going to seal off. And that causes a lot of poor soil structure, but it also causes a lot of our soil compaction. Cold no-till soils, we've heard this quite a bit. Uh, some farmers will tell you that their so soils are cold and wet. Other no-till farmers will say that their soils are warm and moist. So is one lying or, or is there something going on? Well, let's think about this. A lot of this is due to compaction. And uh, one of the things that we know is that when you first go into a field and after it's been tilled and now you're starting to, you decide you're going to no-till it, did you get rid of all the compaction? The answer is no. And so when you come out of the winter and if you've got water in that soil that's, that's standing or ponding, it tends to be cold and uh, especially coming out of the winter. So soils that uh, have more pore space, the air is warmer than the water, and it'll allow that soil to warm up. That's why every time we till a soil, we're going to lose about a half uh, acre inch of water, and it'll actually start to warm that soil up. But it also compacts it at the same time. So then what happens? 
after we get that soil warm, after we get the roots going down there, you're going to find out that this organic matter starts to turn black. And so black residues start to absorb heat. So in really healthy soils where we have we don't have the compaction and we can allow the air to replace the water, it's going to start to warm up. And then if we have these black residues, they're going to absorb the heat and they'll, uh, they'll warm up a soil. And then if we go out another couple years, we start to get thick layers of residue at the surface. Have you ever noticed what happens in a compost pile? The microbiological activity starts to heat up that, uh, that uh, compost pile. So what we're finding out is that when you first go into a compacted uh, tilled soil, it tends to be cold and wet. And over time, as we get into no-till, the soil slowly going to start to warm up. And instead of being cold and wet, it's going to be moist and warm, and that's an ideal place to start to grow uh, corn or soybeans, okay? So why do our soils compact? Well, let's take a look at our crop rotation, and, and we know that anytime we put corn into the rotation, we're gonna get more organic matter uh, than we do if we have soybeans. Also, soybeans are very uh, thinly rooted. They don't, they don't have very much organic matter, but they're also very uh, thin roots, so they don't add a lot of pore space. So, so uh, because of that, uh, if we go into drilled soybeans that has a poor root system and we follow that with corn, corn has a much thicker root and it's often limited by these plow layers uh, in the soil. So uh, it, it's a little bit like when you drill into uh, hard wood. If you use a, a bit with the cover crops, what we're doing, you usually start with a small bit and then you'll pre-drill a hole. That's what the cover crops do. And then when the corn root follows that, it can get down through those same roots and get through those compacted layers and can get deeper into the soil and improve uh, your soil and break up some of that compaction. You also have to ask yourself, what percentage of the time do we have live roots? In a corn-soybean rotation, you may only have four to four uh four to five months out of the year, maybe about a third of the time we actually have live roots in the soil. If we follow that up with wheat, we can greatly increase the amount of roots, or if we follow it up with a cover crop, our goal is to have live roots out there 11 to 12 months out of the year. Does no-till, uh, no cover crop have more live roots than a conventional tilled system? The answer is no, not really. It's not until you add the cover crop that we start to get more roots. We're going to add more soil organic matter. We're going to create more pore space. We're going to start to break up uh, that uh, soil compaction, and we're going to form more macro aggregates to allow air and water to get into the soil. So what's missing in our no-till where we don't have the cover crops? Uh, we just don't have live roots. It's all about live roots, okay? Management impacts on the soil. So here's an example of two soils that are side by side. This was on Dave Brandt's farm and his neighbor's soil 30 feet apart. Dave's been farming his with no-till and cover crops for 30 years. The neighbor was doing uh, corn and soybeans and he was plowing every single year. Are these the same soil type? Well, when you look at it, one's black, and one's kind of a yellow, looks like a yellow clay. And the answer is yes, originally they were the same soil type. Dave, though, has changed his. He's added a lot of organic matter. He's actually uh, transforming uh, that soil into more of what we would call a mollusol soil, which is high in organic matter. So soils do change over time, either for the better or for the worse, okay? Here's some conclusions that we know now. Soil compaction is a biological and man-made problem. Poor soil structures kind of related to a lack of some of the living roots in that soil profile. Uh, that's why we don't have good uh, aggregates uh, uh, out there, the, the macro aggregates. Poor uh, soil compaction is due to poor soil structure, due to a lack of roots, and also excess tillage, which is burning up the organic matter in the soil. So here's some more research from Ohio State from Randall Reeder. He was looking at subsoilers and comparing that to cover crops. Subsoiling yield gains, what will it do for you? 
in a conventional tilled system where they subsoiled, corn yield gains were one to three bushel or about a 3% yield increase. Where they had soybeans, the yield gain was two to five bushel or 10%. Now they went and they had that on a no-till field and they subsoiled it. And what happened? They actually got a yield decrease because they were smearing the soil. So actually subsoiling only works works really well if the soil is dry, but if it's uh, a little bit wetter, which we had a little bit wetter conditions in the no-till, it actually can cause damage. So they got a one to three uh, bushel yield decrease or 3% loss. And on the soybean yields, the losses were two to five, just the exact opposite of what happened where they subsoiled it, okay? And that was a 10% yield loss from the soybeans from subsoiling. Subsoiling versus cover crops. So what can a subsoiler do for you? Well, you'll get an immediate change in the soil structures about maybe as deep as 12 to 18 inches deep. It will increase infiltration short term, but it's going to leave that soil susceptible to compaction later, and it's also going to erode. It's also going to break up your macro aggregate. So you want to be careful. If you are going to subsoil, you need to do it only when soil conditions are right and the soil has to be really dry. What can cover crops do versus the subsoiling? Well, it's going to be a slower change in soil structure, but it's going to go down three feet or deeper. It will increase infiltration. It might take a one to two years, but it will increase it a little slowly. But over time, you'll see that you'll get better water infiltration. You're also going to add organic matter. So you're going to protect that soil from erosion. Uh, you're going to add nutrients and organic matter because that organic matter is going to tie up those soil nutrients and make them plant available. It fits very well into a continuous no-till system, and it helps protect against uh, later uh, soil compaction. So it's just a little slower process. Here's some of the uh, soil resistance to compaction. We're going to rank these. So this was all done by uh, Randall Reeder. Probably the, the worst case scenario is where we subsoil it, we add a lot of oxygen, we deep rip it, and we do full surface tillage. So we're just totally destroying the soil structure uh, in that soil. Moldboard plowing or chisel plowing, that would be next. Then subsoiling, so now we're starting to get a little better. Subsoiling where we have wide space shanks. If we can get to a strip till system, that's going to be better. Shallow tillage, maybe where we use an airway or a Phoenix Harrow. Uh, and we don't do hardly any other tillage, that's not going to be quite as much damage. Then maybe we get into a continuous no-till system where we just have light residue or bare ground at the surface. And then as we move up, well, uh, we go to continuous no-till with heavier residue, and then maybe we start to grow a cover crop, and the ultimate is where we have continuous no-till, controlled traffic, and cover crop. That's where we're going to have the biggest benefit from this system. Here's a slide from Dr. Seward Dykert. I, I really like, like this slide. So what he did is he took a grain uh, truck and hauled it across four different fields that were on the same soil type. So in the lower right-hand corner, this soil was subsoiled. And you'll notice there that those ruts are, are quite deep, okay? So the ruts are somewhere between uh, 6 and 12 inches deep, okay? And this soil is going to be squishy when it's wet, but it gets really hard uh, when it's dry. Now, if you could look at the next one uh, to the left, this is a one-year uh, no-till field. And you'll notice that the ruts aren't nearly as deep. After a year, the no-till ruts are only about three to six inches deep. And if you go to upper right-hand corner, you'll see this is a no-till field that's two years old. Now the ruts are half as deep as what the one year is, so they're only one to two inches deep. You can barely see them anymore, and you're getting a lot more stability. And then we go over to the left, upper left-hand corner, long-term no-till, uh, and we see that this soil is resisting soil compaction. You don't hardly see any ruts, and this soil is going to be firm when it's wet, and it's going to be soft when it's dry. You can actually dig in this soil when it's dry and you won't break your fingernails. So it just shows you that how over time a soil can heal itself by using long-term no-till in a cover crop and it actually has 
a much better structural stability than what the uh, conventional tilled soils. Think about this. Which field would you want to run across if it starts to rain? Do you want to go across a field that's freshly tilled where you're going to get stuck in the mud? Or do you want to go across a field like a pasture that has live roots in it that's going to hold you up and give you structural stability so that you don't get stuck? That's what this picture uh, shows. What are the best cover crops to fight uh, soil compaction and improve soil structure? We find that the grasses are probably the best. They have more fibrous roots. Sorghum sedan, annual ryegrass, cereal rye, the oats are all very good at uh, adding organic matter and giving us pore space. The brassicas are also very good because they have large tap roots and a lot of very fine root hairs on it. So when you look at a radish root, uh, actually about half of that uh, root mass is in the very fine hair. So if you got a really big, large uh, uh, Dacon radish, half the volume. Turnips don't do quite as much because they're shallow rooted. Then if we look at the legumes, they can have a large uh, net, root network, hairy vetch, cow peas, uh, Balencia clover, red and sweet clover, and winter peas. For surface compaction, uh, probably the best thing is buckwheat. For very deep compaction, sunflowers are also very good. Okay, so just an overall summary. Uh, we'll wrap this up. Soil compaction is related to the biology of the soil and how that soil was managed. Tillage does influence how much soil organic matter, how many microbes, the type of microbes, it also has an impact on soil structure and soil compaction. Cold no-till soils are a result of soil compaction and poor soil structure. If you want to uh, make those soils warm and moist, you have to add live roots and go to long-term no-till. Active living roots and the microbes kind of work together to improve our soil structure to form these macro aggregates. And one of the things we're really trying to promote is a combination of no-till plus cover crops, something we like to call ecological farming. Uh, that is the best way. That's kind of the way Mother Nature does it. And uh, NRCS calls this a soil health management system. So that's uh, the biology of soil compaction. Again, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, give me a call or contact me via email. This is Jim Horman for Horman Soil Health Services, talking about the biology of soil compaction.